to the Rebel Alliance Briefing Room Podcast. We are here to podcast about anything and everything Star Wars with you. Please visit our website where you can play current and past episodes. That's https colon backslash backslash r-a-b-r kylejohansson.us That's r-a-b-r dot k-a-i-l-e-j-o-h-a-n-s-e-n dot u Yes. On the left hand side is a navigation menu. You can use this to learn how to load the Rebel Alliance Briefing Room podcast on your Android or Apple phone and tablet. And we have direct links to our podcast on Apple and Google Podcasts. Please participate by connecting to our social media, answering questions of the week, or submitting feedback directly from the site. Again, all of these are available at the Rebel Alliance Briefing Room website at R A B R. K-A-I-L-E-J-O-H-A-N-S-E-N dot U-S. And now, it's time to talk Star Wars. I am Kyle John Johansson, and this is Andrew Scott Sutton. Say hello. 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 Uh, because of, you know, the Easter holiday and, you know, scheduling conflicts and stuff, uh, this has been... Recorded almost a week later, um, and I'm doing it by myself because uh can't get everybody together. Um, and we have a new episode out that we're going to record on on Saturday, so we got to get this one out as soon as possible. And today we're reviewing Star Wars Mandalorian Season 3, Chapter 22, Guns for Hire. We'll discuss the episode uh, in, in detail. We'll recap and in, in end of the in, end of it discussion we'll have a question of the week and then we'll beg you some for some feedback and i might give you a couple predictions or... so let me say we have no news the news um but i want to give you a spoiler alert you better go watch the show um if you don't go watch it then we're gonna spoil it for you first so, this episode was directed by Bryce Dallas Howard. Writer was John Favreau, of course. Edited by Dylan Fershin, uh and J. Eric Lutjesson. Uh, music themes were done by Ludwig Gors- Gormanson. And music score was, of course, Joseph Shirley. And we had quite a cast this week. Um, quite a bit of, quite a few people in here, even as some surprises. Uh, of course, we had uh, a Dinger in Pedro Pascal, and then we had his body doubles, uh, Brandon Wayne and Latif Crowder. Um, we had Bo Katan, Katie Sackoff. Um, Axe Wolves was Simon Cassadenis, and Costa Reeves was Mercedes Vernado. And then we had Captain Bombardier, which was Jack Black. The Duchess was Lizzo. Um, Commissioner Hellgate was Christopher Lloyd. Back to the Future. Nice to see him again. Um, and we had some uh, some Mon Calamari and Corin, um, you know, the, the fish type of uh, things. And um, there was two different things. One was a voice person, and the other person was the actual body person. So the Mon Calamari nobleman was voiced by Harry Holland. The body was David St. Uh, Pierre. The Corrin Captain Shuggoth was voiced by Christine Adams. And the body was, uh, person was Joanne Bennett. The Corrin Navigator was Barry Lowen. There was a lab tech. His name was Ken Cober. Um, B1 Series Droid Foreman was Matt Wood. Um, bartender droid was Seth Gable and Saya Free was Dale Dickey. So that means we're going to uh, run down the road and pick up something at one. We are proud to welcome our latest sponsor, Juan's Cantina, where every first week of the month on the standard galactic calendar, we celebrate with the ancients call Cinco de Mayo. Come join us at Juan's for the food, mariachi music, and 34 flavors of margaritas. That's Juan's Cantina right next to the Hangar 94 of Moss Ugly Spaceport. On day two of the week, 
is Taco Tuesday. All tacos are half a credit each, but enjoyed with our house margaritas. Juan's Cantina also serves the Black Green Flamus Dos Camarones Azul Cerveza, imported directly from Kessel. Thank you again for our latest sponsor, Juan's Cantina. Thank you, Juan's. Yeah, yeah, down the, down the road a little bit. Um, I got a different view here in the background. My microphone today focused on, uh, uh, I think it's the Mandalorian that uh, that uh, is uh, Paz Vizsla. Of course, we got the covert. This is IG-11 over here. The armor. And all kinds of good people that we're used to seeing here. And I know you can barely see them. But uh, anyway, we're reviewing Season 3, Chapter 22 of The Mandalorian, Guns for Hire. Originally aired on April 5th, 2023, and was 46 minutes long. And we're still in the uh, nine before the Battle of Yavin uh, timeline. So that means it's time to grab your favorite beverage, pull up a chair, and join us in the Rebel Alliance briefing room. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we start off with a forbidden love story. Somewhere in space, a Corrin crew member serves a fish to Captain Sugaloth, who is submerged in a cylinder tank of water. After eating the fish, one of the Corrin navigator tells Sugaloth they have found a way to bypass Trask. And that's interesting because Trask is a, is a moon... On a, so they're trying to get past it without. It has a. It's a, populated with Mon Calamari, so they're trying to get around this uh, this Trask moon, um, to get somewhere so they don't get captured. I would guess, and uh, another crew member spots an approaching Imperial starship, lacking the firepower firepower to repel them. Sugaloth orders. Her crew to hail the leader before emerging out of the water tank, which slides down as the water is is sucked out of the tank. Um, she tells the Imperial light cruiser that they are peaceful, Corin freighter heading to the mid rim territories, and to to do business, and were unaware of local warlords who required payment. They responded says that they are not criminals. And then Sugaloth apologizes for any unattended disrespect, saying that the that Galactic Basic is standard is not her first language. She says that they were not aware of the majestic imperial presence in the region. On that on the bridge of the Imperial Light Cruiser, Axe Wolves replies that they are Mandalorians and it is too late to hire them. He is accompanied by other Mandalorians, including Casca Reeves. Wolves explains that they have been sent to track her down. When Sugath protests, this is an act of war. You're going to cause a war. Uh, Wolves responds that they are mercenaries for hire. Not trying to cause a war. They just want to uh, pick up what they were hired for. He declines any of her offers and explains that they have been hired by a Mon Calamari viceroy who believes Sagoth has absconded with his son. Uh-oh. Kissy kissy. Yeah. Sagoth claims this is a lie. And they're unwilling to jeopardize their peace with the Mon Calamari. Wolf says that he understands that Sagoth is in love with the viceroy's son, but the but he has a job to complete. I gotta I gotta get it done, man. You gotta get just just surrender. Give me the Viceroy's son and the Viceroy's son enters the bridge and tells Wolves that he won't be going home. Wolves, Wolves apologizes and says that he's been tasked with bringing his son back to his family. Wolves tells Reeves and her team to make it, make it quick since they have a contract waiting for them on Plazar 15. When the Viceroy's son reiterates his defiance, Wolves tells Sugarth to reason with him because he does not want to damage the 
Damon Sugaloth's ship. Sugaloth tells the Viceroy's son that he is he has to go because she can't risk peace between the two species for a childhood fling. The Viceroy's son is hurt, but Sugaloth reaffirms her love for him while telling him that he needs to leave. Reeves enters the bridge and leads the Viceroy's son away. Sugaloth tells him that he can do it while Reeves leads him away. When the Viceroy's son says that he thought the Mandalorians were honorable, Reeves replies that they can trade honor for a few credits. Meanwhile, there's some guests of Plazar 15 where Bo-Katan has tracked down the the other Mandalorians to. Uh, Bo-Katan and and Dinjarin and Grogu travel on the gauntlet Starfighter to the idyllic planet Plazar 15, which is covered in Mandalorian-style domes. Dinjarin and Krizil notice a fleet of former Imperial warships, which belongs to Krizil, Krizil's former army, led by wolves, who has set themselves up as mercenary, mercenaries. Uh, Bo-Katan thinks that wolves set up a base on the planet because it's not listed in the New Republic registry. When Dinjarin Ask what Wolves and his followers are doing on Plaza 15. Uh, Bo-Katan thinks that Plaza 15 has hired the Mandalorians for protection. Due to their early following out, Bo-Katan decides it's best to land away from the fleet. <clears throat> the Mandalorians and Grogu are greeted by an announcer who assigns them a docking slip before remotely taking over their ship. Bo-Katan says they're going for a ride. And the sh- and they they take full control. After the ship lands at their designated hangar, the Mandalorians and Grogu disembark on a landing platform where they are greeted by a black RA7 protocol droid and a black astromatic ec- droid who tell them to proceed to the Hyperloop pod. When Dendron asks why they would have former Imperial droids in on an outer rim world, Bo-Katan says his guess is as good as hers. <clears throat> when bo asks the automated pod to take them to the Mandalorian fleet stocking rig, the automated system responds that they need to get permission from the High Senate to get access to self-defense forces in a peacekeeping zone under the terms of the Coruscant Accords. The automated system asks the Mandalorians for permission to scan their chain codes. The automated system informs them they have been summoned for a meeting with a local planetary government before the pod speeds away to the meeting. Kind of throws them back a little bit. Whoa! Yeah. And, uh... Mandalorians discuss their next moves while traveling through the the opulent city on the Hyperloop pod. It brings them to a banquet hosted by the Plaza's 15 rulers, Captain Bombardier and the Duchess, who are joined by several aliens, including Biths, Rhodians, Sultanians, and Ithorians. He invites the Mandalorians to sit down before, uh, before serving them secretions. Bombardier tells his guests that he was a former Imperial Facilities Planning Officer who, who through the New Republic's amnesty program, was able to rebuild Plaza 15. The Duchess vouches for her husband, describing him as a rehabilitated former Imperial whom she fell in love with. The Duchess finds Grogu cute, cute and asks if she can cuddle and hold the baby. Cuckoo. And this is where we see uh, Grogu do a, a flip. Uh, after Dinjin says that Grogu does not take kindly to strangers, but he does a, a force flip in the air and, and lands on the Duchess's arms, and he feeds him uh, little uh, fish. The Duchess explains that Plaza Fifteen decided to move to a new age and held direct, direct democratic elections for the first time in their history. Bombardier responds that they are both. Nobility and 
democratically elected leaders, when Din Djarin asks about the Mandalorian ships docked in their fields, the Justice ex explains that they hired them for protection since the Charter of the New Republic prevents them from having a standing military due to their due to her husband's past imperial uh, history. Bombardi claims that all their resources go to the people. <clears throat> now we find out what they're what they're there for. Bo Katan requests a meeting uh, with the Mandalorian privateers and he invites the Mandalorians to see the view uh, while other guests stay behind Bomb Bombardier and the, the Duchess have a private talk with Dinger and, and Bo Katan. <clears throat> they explain that they have problems with the malfunctioning reprogrammed Imperial droids who have caused traffic accidents, heavy equipment failures, and assaults. When Bo Katan asks, what this has to do with them, the nobles explain that Plazar 15's constables are ill equipped to deal with the formal batter, battle droids. Bombardier tries to defend his droids' reprogramming program. When Bo Katan suggests sending the Mandalorian privateers to deal with the problem, the Duchess explains that the Charter prevents any standing army from entering their city and forbids constables from carrying firearms. Dinjarin points out that they are allowed them and uh, Bo Katan to carry weapons. And Bombardier, Bombardier explains that weapons are intrinsic to Mandalorian society, while Plazar 15 is a pacifist society. Bo Katan is reluctant to get involved in the droid problem and says she is not a mercenary. Bombardier offers to extend formal diplomatic recognition to Mandalore in exchange for Bo-Katan's help. He offers to lobby the New Republic to extend diplomatic diplomatic recognition to Mandalore. The Duchess says that she is aware of the split between the wolves and, and Bo-Katan over the ruling of, the, of Mandalore. Bo-Katan replies that she has abandoned her plans to retake Mandalore. The Duchess says that the offer still stands. Uh, when Bo Katan asks Dinjarin what he thinks, he says he is willing to deal with the droid problem. Inside the command center, Commissioner Hellgate briefs Bo Katan and Dinjarin about the situation. Using security cam footage, he explains that rogue Imperial droids were reprogrammed former Imperial stock destined to be scrapped for Carthon, which uh, Carthon is a prison moon that's hosted by Chopfield. Thank you. Google. Though the droids program programming was successful, a rogue rubbish disposal droid malfunctioned and began tossing rubbish into the streets. He shows more footage of malfunctioning and rogue droids, including former battle B-1 battle droid hurling shopping goods at a driver droid causing a land speeder crash and a cook droid attacking patrons with knives. When Bo-Katan suggests turning off the droids, Hellgate explains that there is a failsafe cutoff switch built into the system but the citizens voted against any interruptions to droid services. When Dinjarin inquires into the matter, Hellgate explains that the droids do all the work on Plaza 15, leaving citizens free to do nothing but rec recreation, the arts, and participating in direct democracy. If they shut down the droids, Hellgate says all the citizens will not survive because they have become dependent on the droids. Hellgate tasks the Mandalorians with hunting and eliminating the road droids until they fix the problem. bo tells him to give them a list of rogue droids. And Hellgate responds that they will have to go to the level, lower levels of Plaza 15 to speak to the Ugnaughts. Ugnaughts, yeah. Those are those, are those uh, favorite ones we had the previous season with Krill. The Ugnaught. I have spoken. Uh, 
while descending into the lower levels on a Toberlift, turbo lift, Dindrin tells Bokatan that he warned he is he warned about societies becoming too dependent on droids. The two descended on into a workshop where the Ugnots are busy working on various droids, including a B2 series super battle droid. Uh, Bogotan tells the Ugnots that she has been sent by the Duchess to deal with the droid problem, but is ignored by the Ugnots. Suddenly, Dinjarin introduces himself to the Ugnots, telling them that he is a friend of Nugnot, Ugnot Krill, and he tells them to assist with their questions and tasks that this has an effect on stirring the Ugnots who are served who serve their guest refreshments. Dinjarin explains that he and bo are sent to hunt down and eliminate the malfunctioning droids. And Ugnot denies that there's a problem with the droids. With bo mentions that the droids are wreaking havoc on the surface levels. The Ugnots respond at the halls of the city's central processing unit. Reiterates that the droids are not malfunctioning. Dinjarin replies that they are not suggesting that the Ugnots' workmanship is to blame and vouches for the Ugnots' skill in smiting in smiting droids. He flatters his Ugnots' hosts by telling them that they are the most hardworking species in the galaxy before reiterating their assistance and in investigating the malfunctioning droids. He says, uh, I have spoken. The chief Ugnot speaks with another Ugnot who passes a disc to the Chief, the chief tells Dindrin that this is the list of droids that they seek. I have spoken. Dindrin thanks his host, telling them that he is indebted to them and he has spoken as well. Now they go to investigate. While traveling through the Hyperloop pod, Dindrin explains to Bokatan that there is a customary way for communicating with Ugnots, accusing their work of malfunction. Is considered an insult. Dindarin tells Bokatan that the Ugnots think that the next droid malfunction event will occur at the loading docks. Bokatan is unsure but agrees to investigate this lead. The two travel to the loading dock where repurposed B2 battle droids are loading boxes of cargo. Dindarin alludes to his past encounters with droids. The two are greeted by a B-1 battle droid foreman who tells them they are in a restricted area and requests their identification. Both Katan explains that they have been sent by the Duchess to investigate the droid malfunctions. The B-1 foreman is aware of the reports and tells bo that he had the entire fleet of B-2 loading droids undergo maintenance protocols as a safety measure. To test the foreman's theory, Dingerman, Dingerman tangles with several B-2 loading droids. Most ignore him until Dingerman knocks the crate out of the hands of one. The B-2 battle droid pushes Dingerman aside and runs away with the Mandalorians in pursuit. The droid runs through a crowd of streeted and hurls a crate at, at Dingerman and Bo-Katan, frightening the crowd. The two Mandalorians continue in pursuit. The B-2 droid jumps in front of a land speeder before hurling a power unit at his pursuers. The Mandalorians dodge the object and continue their pursuit through a bar. Dindarin corners the droid by jumping out of the window and landing on it. Uh, bo shoots the droid with her blasters. Constable droids arrive and orders civilians to move away from the crime scene. While inspecting the droid, uh, bo finds a spark pad. Which? Spark pad is a type of identity chip primarily used for droids. What? Where'd it go? Primarily used for droids to denote their affiliation to a particular establishment. Like the resistor. Oh. J -j 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 spark pad for a droid and uh, the b droid bar called the res resistor. 
The two decide to investigate the address while Constable Droids deal with the wrecked droid. They decide to play, uh, they decide to have a little game of good cop, bad cop. They're going to play, uh, you know, um, dun, 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 dun. you know, law and order, criminal, criminal something, I don't know, criminal intent. Uh, well, walking to the resistor, Bo Katan tells Dingerin to let her do the talking, disagreeing with his methods of exposing the road uh, B2 loading droid. They visit the resistor where droids help themselves to various droid beverages. The droid patrons respond with silence chirp, 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 when the Mandalorians enter, leading Dingerin to reason that they don't expect many they don't expect many organics in that bar. Bo-Katan speaks to the droid bartender who confirms that this is the resistor. Yep, you got the right place. She shows the bartender the spark pad that belongs to Rogue B2 Battle Droid. She explains that there's been a series of malfunctions leaked to this bar. When the bartender professes his innocent, uh, Dingerin raises a tool and threatens to remove his memory circuits unless he cooperates. Ah! The other droids watch and shock. <gasps> a blue protocol droid, which is pretty cool. It's a blue C-3PO. That thing is awesome looking. Starts to walk away, but Dingerin orders it and the other droids not to move. Nobody's leaving. Grizel tries to reason with Dingerin and says that their behavior is programmed and that they all they do is reason. Dingerin responds that all droids are supposed to not harm organics, but many do not follow that rule. bo tells Dingerin not to assume that the droid bar is the problem. The bartender offers to help, but Dingerin is suspicious of the droid. The droid tells his Mandalorian visitors that the droids are anxious about being replaced by humans, stating that most of them have been refurbished and reprogrammed. He explains that several droids date back to the Confederacy of Independent Systems, which is a long time ago. Let's see. Confederacy of Independent Systems, otherwise known as the Separatist Alliance or the Separatist State. Oh, so this is a the Separatist is what started the whole, uh, you know, Clone Wars thing going on. All right, where were we? Uh, uh, separatist system. While the New Republic would scrap most of the droids, Plazar 15 gives them a second chance. Dindrin says that the recent string of catastrophes doesn't help the droids' case. The bartender explains that is why they want their help. He reiterates that they do not want to be replaced since they have a lot to contribute. The droid says that human life is so short and they can... Return the favor to the organic creators. Various uh, droids beep and cheer in unison. Da -da 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 -da. Yay, we like that. Uh, bo says the droid bartender, a selection of beverages, the malfunctioning units ordered. The bartender explains that all droids on Plaza 15 are serve Nepathy, a lubricant that protects against mechanical wear. Uh, refreshment sub particles. It uh, so it delivers uh, uh, new programming and uh, lubricates all the other all the parts. When Dingerin asks if Nepathine reprograms the local droids, the bartender explains that it patches the programming as the commands of the mainframe change. He shows them a box of spark pads and observes that all the malfunctioning droids. Invited from the same batch of nepathine. Oh. Bo Katan and Dingerin look at each other. Uh oh, that's a coincidence. So they've uncovered a conspiracy. 
Later, they take the uh, sample of the nepothene to a female lab tech, and she shows the Mandalorians the remains of the malfunctioning B2 battle droid they tangled with. Uh, Grizzle tells the tech, or bo tells the correct tech that she is looking for uh, programming subparticles. So they extract some from the uh, B2 battle droid, and they following a test, the tech confirms that the particles are still active. Suddenly, the white spherical lab droid goes amuck and attacks the humans with a laser blaster. Dinjarin destroys the droid with a dark saber. Ooh, dark saber to the rescue. Bo-Katan agrees. The particles, they're definitely active. Yep, I would say so. Using a microscope, the lab tech discovers that the subparticles are actually nanodroids. What? Bo-Katan asks how the nanodroids got in the nepothene. When Dinjarin notices the starations, the lab te tech thinks they are aberrations in the metal. And bo realizes they are writings. There's something written on there. She rotates the microscope. bo realizes the writings are a chain code. Oh, what chain code? The lab tech studies the chain code and deduces that they were malfunctioned by the Techno Union. Oh, yeah, the Techno Union. Robots Union. And they have been in storage for ages. The lab tech says it is peculiar that the chain title says that the nanodroids did not arrive by droid acquisition. When Dindarin asks how they arrived, the tech says they were chased they were chased by security officers, which is illegal under law. The tech determines that these chains codes were ordered by an individual, Commissioner Hellgate, oh, head of security, oh, conspiracy uncovered. The Mandalorians leave to confront Hellgate, who is overseeing the security camera system. bo tells Hellgate that, the, that they have lots of questions. He tries to brush them away, but Dindarin tells him they are aware of the nepothene and nanodroids. Bo-Katan adds that he, he programmed them to attack and disrupt. bo demands that he surrender to their custody, but Hellgate threatens to trigger a failsafe that would cause the droid workforce to attack the civilian population on Plazar 15. bo tells Hellgate that there is no way out and to give up. Hellgate counters that he, that he never surrendered to the Galactic Republic and the Galactic Empire, when bo remarks that he is a Separatist. Oh, that Separatist. Oh, that bad. Hellgate counters, that is a pejorative term, and claims he supports democracy. As Hellgate moves to touch the failsafe button, he praises Count Dooku as a visionary who was murdered by the Chancellor's Jedi Enforcers. However, bo Shoots him, Hellgate, Hellgate with a electroshock dart before he can touch the button. The office staff are, are watching st in shock. They're all they all get up. Oh, look at that. Elsewhere, Grogu tell, helps the Duchess and Bombardier play a game that involves sending balls through hoops with the Force. The nobles and their guests are impressed with Grogu's abilities. Dingerin and Kr bo bring Hellgate to the Duchess and Bombardier. When Bombardier condemns his, his actions as despicable, Hellgate remarks about the quacked uh, calling the stifling sliny. Which we've heard that before, too. Just a crazy phrase. Yeah. He blames Bombardier for making the planet unrecognizable. The Duchess is shocked and upset by his betrayal. The Duchess affirms for Bombardier calling for acceptance and forgiveness for, for former Imperials. Hellgate seeks, seeks the Duchess's forgiveness. The Duchess says that she may consider forgiving him, but sentences him to exile on the moons of Paraquat. Constable droids 
escort Hellgate away to his purgatory. As a reward for their services, the Duchess grants Bo-Katan and Dinjarin an audience with the Mandalorian privateers and their highest honor, the key to Plazar. Ooh, it's a big key in it. Funny, it looks like a uh, Millennium Falcon on one end. Uh, but anyway, she tells Bo-Katan that she is always, she's always welcome to their uh, domed paradise. The Duchess also knights Grogu as a knight of the ancient order of independent regencies. Wow. Which is a silverish order of the galaxy. So this chivalrous order that uh, it's kind of made up. So she bids the travelers farewell. Dindarin carries Grogu, who waves goodbye to the hostess. Bye bye. He's like over the shoulder. Bye bye. Ah. Uh, now we confront the uh, the uh, the other Mandalorians. While traveling in the Hyperloop pod, Dinjarin reassures Bo-Katan that she is the leader and that her people will follow her. Bo-Katan responds that Wolves is now the le their leader and that she will figure out her playbook when she gets there. After arriving at the Mandalorian's encampment, the two receive a frosty reception from Wolves who ask Bo-Katan if she has come to join them as mercenaries. Grogu watches from his, his little uh, pod. Uh, Bo-Katan responds that she has come to reclaim her fleet. Wolves counters that he is the commander of the fleet now. Bo-Katan challenges Wolves to a single combat for leadership, which he accepts. Wolf fires his rocket at Bo-Katan, and she reactivates her jetpack and charges at Wolves, knocking him to the ground. The two fight with Viber Blades, but Bo-Katan knocks him to the ground. Reeves and the others watch with concern. Unwilling to give in, Wolves charges at Bo-Katan with his jetpack and rams her into a starship. The two fight with their fists, and he hurls her aside. Bo-Katan charges at him with her jetpack before grabbing him in a headlock. She demands that he yield, but he rockets them on top of a starship. After a tussle, Bo-Katan drags Wolves down to the, to the group with her whipcord launcher. Wolves attacks her with a flamethrower, but she blocks the blast with her personal combat shield, which is that blue shield that they seem to have. Uh, Bo-Katan manages to knock Wolves to the ground and demands that he yield at knife point. Wolves refuses to recognize her as the true leader of their people because she won't take the dark saber from Dinjarin, whom he regards as a as the rightful contender. Bo-Katan responds that enough Mandalorian blood has been spilled by Wolves and spares him. Bo-Katan tells Wolves' followers that Mandalorians are stronger together. We must be together. We love each other. Wolves counters that Dindarin is a misguided zealot who is not of Mandalorian blood. And Bo-Katan counters that Dindarin took the Mandalorian creed and chose to walk the way of the Mandalore just like their ancestors. Bo-Katan adds that Dindarin is every bit of Mandalorian as they are. Wolves responds that the Ruler of Mandalore should possess the Dark Saber. Dindarin offers to hand Bo-Katan the Saber, but says it is not a gift. To help her ascend, Dindarin admits that he was captured by the cyborg in the mines of Mandalore and that the Dark Saber was taken from him. He explains that Bo-Katan rescued him and killed the cap his captor. Dindarin asks the Mandalorians to consider whether the dark saber is right, for, rightfully belongs to Bo-Katan. Uh, Wolf agrees that it does belong to her, and Dindarin hands the blade to Bo-Katan, who accepts it. She activates the dark saber in the presence of the other Mandalorians. And then uh, we get credits. Credits coming down. Credits all over. 
Creditophilia. All right, so uh, we want to hear what you have to say about that. And I'm going to pull something up here because we have a question of the week that we've already created. And that question is, will the Mandalorians reclaim Mandalore? Since that's the uh, ultimate plan here. And, you know, I think ultimately they will. I think the Mandalorians are going to prevail. I do believe that they're going to run into some problems. You know, I don't know. Maybe they see a, a mythosaur or some other monster that uh, that uh, causes problems. Um, you know, they, they can't be the only ones around either. There's got to be some other Mandalorians around. So maybe they, uh, they meet up with some more on the way uh, to Mandalore. Um, you know, we know that, uh, that getting, uh, from orbit down to the planets is kind of rough, it seems like. Um, so hopefully, you know, they can't detect anything on the ground, so hopefully they can, uh, you know, there's nothing there to, uh, to stop them. Um, even if there is, I think that the Mandalorians are still strong enough to, um, to take Mandalore, um. I have some weird suspicions about the armor, though, um, and and we'll see that later because we, uh, we'll, I think that's what our next episode is going to be about is uh, taking Mandalore. Um, so so like I said, we'll see about that um, going forward, and that's the question. Um, we want you to send us as much feedback as you can about this episode. Or any episode, or you know, anything I've done or said, um, and that can be done by feedback, 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 feedback at kylejohansen.us. That's feedback, feedback, k a i l e j o h a n s e n dot us. That's right, feedback. So. We've got that email address, feedback at kylesorhanson.us. We also have a link on the website. What It's over on that side. Um, that uh, gives you a form. You fill it out and it sends it to us. Um, you can also answer the question of the week. And there's a comment section under each question where you can you know, explain it or put anything else you want in there. Um, we're available on Twitter at super underscore duper underscore pod. And we have our videos on YouTube and Spotify. Um, and there's comments available uh, to be had there as well. So please go and give us as many comments as you can because we want to talk to you. And since, uh, you know, I'm going solo here today, there's not much I... And discuss with everybody else but you know i think this is a pretty good episode it was uh worth being in there it seemed like it was kind of weird at the beginning there where we're we're having the uh the fish people having a little you know disagreement a uh, little lover's quarrel kind of thing or you know uh, a romeo and juliet kind of thing going on um but uh i think uh you know ultimately we ended up kind of bo reuniting with her previous crew and uh, they seem to have a pretty good uh, amount of um, ships that can, they can defend uh, on and everything like that. So hopefully, uh, you know, with that light cruiser, they will have the ability to um, take Mandalore next week. So I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Rebel Alliance Briefing Room Podcast. Please visit our website where you can play current and past episodes. That's https colon backslash backslash r-a-b-r kylejohansen.us That's r-a-b-r dot k-a-i-l-e j-o-h-a-n-s-e-n dot u-s On the left hand side is a navigation menu. You can use this to learn how to load the Rebel Alliance Briefing Room podcast on your Android or Apple phone and tablet. 
and we have direct links to our podcast on Apple and Google Podcasts. Please participate by connecting to our social media, answering questions of the week, or submitting feedback directly from the site. Again, all of these are available at the Rebel Alliance Preacher Room website at R-A-B-R-K-A-I-L-E-J-O-H-A-N-S-E-N dot U-S. This podcast in no way is approved, sponsored, or owned by Lucasfilms LTD, Disney, Disney Plus, or any of its subsidiaries. All opinions are solely owned by Kyle and or Scott, and in no way express the views or opinions of their past or present employers. Views and opinions are not supported or restricted by Lucasfilms, LTD, Disney, Disney Plus, or any of its subsidiaries. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or any or other use of this podcast and its affiliate sites without consent of Super Duper Podcast Network and its host is prohibited. I am Kyle John Hanson, and this is Andrew Scott Sutton. Say goodbye now. Here. Goodbye. He's not here. We, uh, like I said, I'm doing a solo run because Easter and everybody was having conflicts with times and whatever. And, you know, basically I was super busy with cleaning and preparing and fixing food and, you know, doing stuff. So thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.